Um, I'll take school facts for 800, Alex. This is the most useless class that a person could take in school. Oh, oh man. What is... poetry? I'm sorry, Jeff, but the correct answer is all of them. They're all useless. In my first video, I didn't have enough time to say this, but I hate it when people are cool with their teachers. I understand that some teachers are more laid back than others, and sometimes they'll ask the class, so how was everyone's weekend? Then if you want to talk about something or have important news, then you can share it. My dog died! Haha, <laughs> yeah, they do that. But there is a line and you shouldn't cross it. Don't talk to your teacher just to talk to them during class. I don't know how much of a problem this is in other places of the world, but sometimes there would be kids in my class that would say, Hey Susan, how was your daughter's dance recital? Did you remember all of her moves? I saw the video you posted on Facebook. It looked like she was having a fun time. Stop it! Stop it! Stop it! Maybe I wouldn't have been a good teacher. Before I tell you about my poetry teacher, I need to tell you about the preparatory school I went to so you can better understand where I'm coming from. So I went to a preparatory school in ninth grade and first off, what is a preparatory school? Google says it's a private school that prepares students for college. Now hearing that definition, you might think, wait, don't all schools prepare students for college? Isn't that a school's job? And you might think that a preparatory school is more fancy and made out of marble and all the kids come from rich families. <laughs> No. What it means is that the schools get little government funding and parents have to pay for desks and the teacher's salary. I know different private schools will vary depending on how rich the parents are. I'm sure that school made out of marble exists somewhere, but the preparatory school I went to was relatively worse than a normal public school. The school I went to didn't even have desks. They had fold-up tables and the chairs were fold-up too. How did they- Oh. Well, now I know where all the budget went. The main difference between a public school and a prep school is that a prep school is smaller and there's a uniform and there's lockers. So why did my twin sister and I attend a preparatory school? Because twins have superpowers and we need to go to a special school to enhance our abilities. Nah, I'm just, I'm just kidding. I'm, I'm kidding. That'd be cool though. We went because when we were starting our freshman year, our older brother was a senior and he was already attending this preparatory school and my mom didn't want to drive to two high schools to pick us up. We already had a carpool in place. You can't just mess with the carpool. And me and my sister didn't know what to expect from a public high school. We've never been. We thought we'd get bullied or something. Boy, I feel like picking on someone today. <laughs> yeah, sure, we can go to a prep school. I mean, what's the worst that can happen? Well, the carpool we had made it so we would arrive at the school super early before everyone else, and we'd be picked up from the school super late. And also, because it was a prep school, they gave out a stupid amount of homework. I remember breaking up the homework into pieces, like, okay, I can do the geometry while I'm waiting for school to start, the biology homework I can do during geometry class, and I have choir after lunch so I can just do this during lunch. Ah, look at me being responsible. I have a little sister who just finished her freshman year in a public high school and she thinks it was so hard. Oh, you thought your ninth grade was hard? Try doing twice the amount of homework and wear the same pants every day. So now the only question remaining is, why did my older brother go to a prep school in the first place? Bro, why did you go to a prep school in the first place? IDK just decided to. Just felt like I should. My mom reads my scripts and she told me that he went to a prep school because one of his friends said that there were cute girls at the school, so he decided to stay there for four years. Okay, now let's talk about my poetry teacher. I'll call him Mr. Poe, because that's short for Poe. A tree. Poetry wasn't even an elective class. Every freshman was required to take it. And surprisingly, poetry was only the second most useless class you took at the school. The sophomores took a class on Latin. You know, that dead language that no one speaks. So Mr. Poe, I don't want to judge him too hard. I don't know how he was like outside of school, but just picking up the vibes I got from him as a 14 year old, I think he was depressed. I mean, to be fair, anyone who likes poetry probably has something wrong in their head. But Mr. Poe just seemed sad all the time. Every single day he would start the class by saying, It's the best day ever. Which, if you think about it, saying that every day only means that the days are going to get better and better, which is sort of poetic. But I think Mr. Poe was lying to himself. Also, Mr. Poe really liked anacondas. I mean, snakes. He really liked snakes. Sometimes he would go off on tangents talking about snakes. Royal pythons, also called American ball python, got their name because they turned into a ball when they get nervous. Also, did you know that snakes have to... Never mind. Sometimes in class we'd be analyzing poetry, and Mr. Poe told us that every single word in a poem was important. The poet didn't have to use the word the, but they did. What did they mean? Sometimes we would spend days analyzing a single poem, taking notes and talking about what we thought the poet meant. One time a poem we were reading had someone talking, so there were quotation marks at the start of the sentence, but there weren't quotation marks at the end. The poet forgot to put end quotes. I remember noticing it and thinking, aha, 
a clue! Mr. Poe, I just made a breaking discovery. There's no end quotes here, meaning that the whole rest of this poem is told by this character. And Mr. Poe said, oh no, that's just a typo. Well, frickin', why am I perfectly nitpicking this piece when the poet purposely put poor punctuation in his poems? Pterodactyl! This is gonna sound off topic, but do you guys know what lateral thinking puzzles are? Lateral thinking puzzles are sort of like riddles, but more stupid. You're given a strange situation with little information, and you have to ask the person who told you the puzzle yes or no questions to get the answer. My favorite lateral thinking puzzle is this because it's so stupid. A man goes into a restaurant, orders albatross, eats one bite, and then jumps off a bridge. Why? Now normally, if we were playing legitly, you would ask me yes or no questions like, was the man in a relationship? And I would answer them saying, well, not anymore. The explanation is this, I'm not going to read it out because it's super long and complicated, but you can read it if you want. Well, Mr. Poe also liked to tell these lateral thinking puzzles, but his solutions were more... dumber. One of the puzzles he told the class was, you're trapped in a restaurant, how do you get out? Now, I can think of like five solutions right off the top of my head. Okay, through the door, through a window, use a crowbar if it's locked. There's probably a sharp knife to cut through a wall, or you can dig a hole under everything with a spoon. But it was actually none of those answers. So, how do you get out of a restaurant you're trapped in? You get an education. Okay, let me explain. You're trapped in a restaurant because you're a waiter. That's your job. And to get out of the restaurant, you need to get a good education so you can get a better job. Kind of like how I was able to quit my job in the food industry by getting an education. It's funny because he dropped out of college. So the class got the answer to that riddle, but Mr. Poe told us another riddle and we never figured that one out. And that riddle is, anyone can dig a ditch, but it takes a real man to... Blank. Given that the answer to the first riddle was education, the answer to this could be anything. I really wanted to know the answer to this riddle, so I googled it hoping that Mr. Poe just stole it from the internet, and I found this song, anyone can dig a hole close enough to a ditch, but it takes a real man to call it home. Which sounds poetic enough, let's see if the song gives us any more clues. Mr. Poe, I didn't know you were into this sort of stuff. So I wish I could give you the answer, but I don't have one. Feel free to guess what you think the answer is and give your reasoning in the comments. That'll be fun to read. But I will say the answer that I did come up with that I think makes the most sense. Anyone can dig a ditch, but it takes a real man to... hide the body. I'm sort of stealing this idea from Jaden Animations. Wait, no, that's not right. I'm not stealing it. I'm plagiarizing it. Jaden did a video talking about random thoughts she had and you should all go watch it. And I thought, hey, I think randomly sometimes. So Jaden, is it all right if I make a video about my random thoughts? I hope you say yes because I just did. What is happiness? Well, it's a chemical in your brain. And how do you get that chemical? Well, it's just a little something I like to call drugs. I think humans make fun of hairless animals way too much. We think that all hairless animals are ugly. Just go to Google Images and type in hairless animal and you'll probably think the animals you see there are ugly as well. But we all seem to forget that we're hairless animals too. If anything, other animals should think that we're ugly. So I look at this phenomenon and I have a theory. I think we humans find things covered in hair more cute. We're more attracted to things covered in hair. And that's why I'm a furry. My dad never taught me how to shave and one time I cut myself shaving right above my lip and for the rest of the day all I could smell was blood. I don't know why I mentioned the dad part. You know how websites will ask you to type in a bunch of misshapen letters to make sure you're not a robot? That's called a CAPTCHA. And some of those CAPTCHAs are impossible. Sometimes I look at a CAPTCHA and think, am I a robot? I just wanted to send some email. I didn't want to question my identity. I wasn't ready for an existential crisis club, Penguin. Sorry, that joke is dead. Just like Club Penguin. So here's the random thought. What if we lived in a robot society and robots had to prove that they weren't human to make a Facebook account? I think their CAPTCHA would be an optical illusion. Like to sign into a website, it'll show two lines and say, prove you're not a human, which line is bigger? Optical illusions are like CAPTCHAs for people. Every time you paint a room, it gets a little bit smaller. And if it takes you one can of paint to paint an entire room, then the room gets smaller by one can of paint. You brought a can of paint inside the room and you never took it out. Every time you smell something, molecules from that thing get sucked up into your nose and that's how you're able to smell it. So that means every time you smell something, it gets a tiny bit lighter. Do archeologists have lingo and jokes that only other archeologists will understand? Like there's a whole other world of jokes that I won't get to experience because I'm not an archeologist. Like one day two archeologists could be digging a hole and one says, I'm not finding anything. And then the other guy says, well, you know what they say in the archeology span business, 
and I don't know what they say because I'm not an archaeologist. How about we look up jokes for archaeologists? Why did Robin Hood pull out of the archery contest? He found it an arrowing experience. Okay, get that one? It just wasn't that funny. Nor was it about archaeology. Or maybe it was, and I just don't get it. We'll never know. Where did Caesar keep his armies? Up his sleeves. Okay, I had to get this one explained to me, but armies is supposed to be your arm, like your body arm, and your armies go up your sleeves. Get it? Except Julius Caesar wore a toga, so he didn't even have sleeves. And you could just say this about anyone who had an army. Where did Hitler keep his armies? Up his sleeves, oh, ha ha ha! When you ask someone what time it is, sometimes they'll say, it's a quarter to blank. And first off, I really hate that way of telling time. Because now I have to use math just to know what time it is. Someone will say, it's a quarter to eight. Okay, so a quarter to eight, well a quarter is 25, so eight minus 25, it's like, Negative 13. Wait, no, we're using time numbers. So a quarter of 60, that's like 10 minutes. So eight minus 60 over four, you carry the two and... Oh, it's eight o'clock now. We usually only say it's a quarter to when referring to whole numbers. But I wish people would use other times like, hey, what time is it? Oh, it's a quarter to 837. Did you know that mosquitoes prefer type O blood more than any other blood type? Does that mean our blood tastes different? How can mosquitoes sense what blood type we are? Do mosquitoes think we come in different flavors? What if there was a restaurant for mosquitoes and the menus just had our blood types? Are there mosquito snobs? Like one mosquito would say, Oh, I see you're drinking O negative. Hmm. Of course you'd like that blood. Everyone likes that blood. I got that whole idea from a conversation I had with Jaden and I said I was going to use it in my random thoughts video, so I'm just stealing everything from Jaden. You know what I think would be a funny contradiction? A fedora with a Tumblr logo on it. Whenever you leave for a trip, people will say, drive safe, which is fine. I always appreciate safe driving tips, but when you go flying in an airplane, sometimes people will say, have a safe flight, but I literally have no control if a plane flies safely or not. Why are you telling me to fly safe? I should be the one telling the pilot that. Hey, I just wanted to say that a lot of my friends are counting on you, so you better not screw this up. I appreciate the sentiment, but how do I fly unsafe? Maybe go on my phone before we take off, not watch the safety video? Blow the plane up? Why do people care so much about fashion? If I bought some really nice clothes and I go to a party, out of everyone in that room, I'm the only one who can't see what I'm wearing. Unless I look down the entire time. I can go to a party and be wearing just a bunch of clown makeup, and as long as there's no mirrors around and everyone plays it cool, I would have no idea that I'm wearing anything. And also, it doesn't matter what I'm wearing because I look good in everything. I think this whole YouTube thing has given me a confidence boost. I wouldn't say it's an unhealthy amount, but it's given me confidence that I didn't have in high school. My parents bought me a Pokemon shirt for Christmas, and yeah, I like Pokemon, but I don't want the whole world to know that. And in high school, I wouldn't have worn any remotely geeky shirt. But now I can go outside and not even realize that I'm wearing my Pokemon shirt. And when I do realize, I usually think, huh, that's embarrassing. Ah, I'm the odd ones out, who cares? When my parents were my age, they already had a child. And here I am, wearing a Pokemon shirt. You know how different states in America will have different names for certain things? Like some states call it pop instead of soda, or how they call it a washroom instead of a bathroom, and apparently in Rhode Island they call a water fountain a bubbler, and everywhere else is just normal? Anyway, once I heard that down south, there's a phrase for when it's raining and the sun is still out. And that phrase is, the devil meeting his wife. Oh, isn't that so sweet? That means anyone can find happiness, even the devil. Ah, I love it when we give the devil more innocent and human characteristics. And given how few of times it rains in Arizona, I don't get to use that phrase very often. So already when it's raining, it's like, Woo, it's raining, this day is gonna be great. But then when the sun's out, I get to say, look guys, the devil's meeting his wife. Ah, I hope they're happy together. Unfortunately, I misheard what that phrase was when I learned it. It's not the devil meeting his wife, it's actually the devil beating his wife. So I guess they're not happy together. I was so sad when I learned what it actually was. I don't know who this devil's wife is, but you need to find a new man, dude. And to think, I almost thought of you as an all right guy, Satan. I looked up that saying on Wikipedia, and in Tennessee they say, the devil is kissing his wife. So I guess in Tennessee, the devil's romantic, but everywhere else he just can't stand her. And the worst variation I could find has to be what they say in France. In France, when it rains and the sun's out, they say, the devil is beating his wife and marrying his daughter. Whoa, 
Whoa, France. I'd expect that sort of behavior from Tennessee, but not you, France. Why do you have to be so dramatic to describe your weather? I don't want to even know what you call snowstorms. So anyway, those are my random thoughts. I swear I don't do drugs. What's in the box? I said, what's in the box? I said, what's in the box? I can make a great boat out of this. So this one time when I was in the third grade, for some reason our teacher thought it would be a good idea to get his entire class to participate in a cardboard boat race. Cardboard boat racing is this event where teams of people build their own boats out of cardboard and then race against other people's cardboard boats. Now you might be thinking that cardboard really isn't the best material to make a boat out of. And you're right, but cardboard is cheap, you can get big pieces of it, and they float in the water for a little bit. Perfect for making boats out of. It's good, short-lived entertainment. It's yachts of fun. Apparently, a lot of other schools got their students to do cardboard boat racing. I thought it was just a strange thing my teacher made us do. But if other teachers did it, I guess he wasn't the only weirdo. I don't know what cardboard boat racing is supposed to teach you. Maybe teamwork skills and shipbuilding. I mean, it would come in handy if I was stranded on an island with cardboard and duct tape and I could tell everyone, Don't worry guys, I learned how to make boats out of these things in the third grade. But no one else in my school did cardboard boat racing. It was just my class. And I think part of the reason we did this was because the class I was in was an honor honors class, so we were better than everyone else. Guys, I need to tell you about how friggin' smart I am. So in the second grade, everyone took this test to see if you would get put into the honors class, which, I'm gonna be honest, I don't remember taking it. I just remember my mom sitting me and my twin sister down and telling us that we weren't gonna be in the same class anymore because I made it into the honors classes and my sister didn't. Haha, <laughs> loser! The honors program was called DOGS, which stood for DANG! <laughs> Original gangsta students. Okay, that's not actually the name I made that up. If you got accepted into dogs, you stayed in the dogs program for the rest of elementary school. So I basically had the same kids in my class for five school years. And our class became known as the dogs kids. I think since I was in the dogs program, I wasn't bullied nearly as much as I should have been. Because everyone in my class was a huge nerd. Also, I never really learned how to interact with people socially because I already knew everyone in my class. So all the dogs were cool with each other, but all the non-dogs hated us. They thought that us dogs thought that we were so much better than them, and we were. Now call me old fashioned, but I think the third grade is a little too soon to tell if you're smart or not. I would say that the dogs program did not make me a smarter person. I don't speak for everyone, this was just my experience, but in high school my twin sister was a way better student. High school didn't have the dogs program, so me and my sister were in the same classes again, and she was a straight A student while I was about a straight B and C student. So all the math I've learned is telling me that something's not adding up. It probably had nothing to do with being in the honors program in elementary school. I probably just procrastinated a lot in high school. Okay, now let's get back to the actual topic of the video. Leading up to the event, the teacher wanted us to stay after school to help make the boats, and I, being the loyal dog that I was, stayed after school exactly zero times. Sorry dudes, I take the bus home, and last time I missed the bus, my mom got mad at me and I cried, and she had to pick me up. So actually, if I was deserted on an island, I wouldn't be much help. I would have to get my mom to pick me up. This event was at a medium-sized man-made lake in Arizona, because we don't have real lakes, they're all man-made. And it was right next to a college, and a lot of college kids like to get drunk there. We ended up making two boats. One was white, and one was blue with a dragon head at the front and a tail in the back, and they both could hold ten people. There wasn't enough room for everyone in the class to get a spot on the boat, and the kids who actually helped build it got a reserved seat. But since I was a scrawny white boy that didn't take up much space, I gotta sit in the very front, because they were the coolest and smallest seats. The person who I sat next to was this girl named Priscilla. I still keep in contact with her and I asked if I could say her name in this video and she said yes. Later in life, she was the first girl to ever slap me. I didn't ask permission to tell that story. While we were waiting for our turn to race, my dad got me a snow cone and that snow cone was the very first time I remember getting a brain freeze. It hurts to eat this. Yeah. They do that. When it was our turn, we rowed the boat out and we actually stayed afloat. I mean, it was only a couple inches away from sinking, but it worked. My mom told me beforehand that if the boat sunk, I should kick off my shoes because that would weigh me down and I would drown. Thanks for the vote of confidence, mom. And I remember being so afraid of the boat sinking. Not because I could drown, but because I didn't want to lose my shoes. So there we were, a bunch of eight-year-olds in a glorified cardboard box, on a lake, with three other boxes filled with drunk college students. The course we had to take was pretty simple. It only had two left turns. Should have been a piece of cake. And we were doing pretty good until we had to make the first left turn. We messed up on that part. 
We practiced turning on land all the time, but for some reason when we were in the water, our turning maneuver wasn't working. We kind of just drifted forward. We were pretty much all stranded. We didn't know how to drive this thing, and we were running out of time since the cardboard doesn't last that long when it's wet. But there were these lifeguard slash helper people going around in canoes, and one person came up to our boat and he just kind of pushed it with his paddle and he turned the boat, and we were back in the race. Well, actually, by this point, everyone else had already completed the course, but we were still floating. We were still going to finish this. When it came time for the second turn, the same thing happened. We didn't learn anything. They never taught us this in honors classes. By this point, the next four people racing just went. They got tired of waiting. And while the canoe boat guy was trying to teach us how to turn, the other boats just passed us. Eventually, we did get the turning thing down and we made it back to shore. The boat stayed up the entire time. Out of the four people we raced against, we came in eighth. I kinda wish something bad did happen, like the boat flipped over or a shark ate one of the kids. That would have been a better YouTube video. But that also would have been lying. And then afterwards, the president came down and high-fived all of us. And to prove I'm not lying, here's some pictures of me in front of the boat. We had to take the dragon head off because it didn't fit with all of us, but we kept the tail. And you'll also notice how cramped the seats are and the girl who later on slaps me. Here's a boat with a roof. Here's a picture of the snow cone that gave me my first brain freeze. Here's us in the water next to a pretty big boat. And look, our other white boat is getting blocked off by the bigger boat. Notice how our boat is going in the wrong direction and how close we are to being submerged. And here's a picture of the grown-ups carrying the boat out of the water after a long day, and I'm not in this picture. I wanted to get to land as soon as possible. Here's a picture of me during Halloween. I dressed up as a ninja. I think it was the Halloween after the bunny. And there's a plushie of a Neopet in the background. Do you guys remember Neopets? All my Neopets are probably dead now. Here's a picture of me with a giant pencil. It's actually a model rocket, but it looks like a pencil. Isn't that adorable? Remember my science fair video where I launched rockets? Yeah, this wasn't that time. This is a completely different model rocket. And here's me in a tub of animal plushies. And this bird plushie right here was actually my favorite. I got them from someone else's birthday. It was in a goodie bag. It was a pirate themed birthday. So it was like, you know, a little tiny parrot. I really liked that bird. His name was Birdie and now he's gone. And here's me dressed up as Galileo. 